do a fairly quick overview of infrastructure as code, um, scripted infrastructure. So, obviously, some of you already scripted your infrastructure, some of you have never scripted your infrastructure. Uh, hopefully, it'll be a fairly good level. Um, kind of not just AWS specific, but a few like the functions and things that I like using. So, you've got John there doing some, some dev work. Uh, so we'll go through what is infrastructure as code, what's it good for, what's it not good for, uh, how to use it, so some tools, organizing templates, structure, um, of like different templates, and then some key kind of functions and functionality of infrastructure as code that might be useful if you're not already using it today. So what is infrastructure as code? Uh, so hopefully the, the diagram represents clearly uh, just a file, a template uh, that creates virtual environments. So it's represented as code. Some people call it scripted infrastructure. Some people call it programmable infrastructure. All the same sort of stuff, really. So it's a descriptive model uh, in a machine readable definition. Usually, it's some kind of template. Um, allows you to create and manage infrastructure, whether that's networks virtual machines, load balancers, connection topology, whatever you want, generally. Um, some kind of tools will generate the templates for you. Some of you write the templates, but we'll talk about that. So what's it good for? Uh, so if you've got your laptop or your phones, uh, I'd like you to go to menti.com, type in this code. Um, And then you can add your thoughts. The URL doesn't work for me, uh, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Is it, is it Manti or Mantimeter.com? Manti.com. Not working. Probably not allowed for India. Can we have please? It works, it's working. I wonder if put on VPN. It is not working on India. It's working on the VPN. <laughs> but I also put phone as well, so kind of. <laughs> I can't finish something through this. So, <laughs> so what we're going to do here is I change the title a little bit. Infrastructure code makes things. Uh, and as you can see, the more people use particular words, uh, the bigger they get. So you can see repeatable has been used there a few times. Infrastructure code makes things repeatable, makes it scalable, uh, makes it reproducible. Uh, frustrating, cheese, cheesy, um, oh. it's getting bigger. Okay, I might have to, I might have to close the entries for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Shubham's going to overtake scalable soon. For some reason, <laughs> for some reason cheese is. It's not unique for a single person. I just uh, mentioned. 10 to 5 times the scalable word, and it is now on the top. So, uh, infrastructure makes things, infrastructure is called makes things shubham, uh, makes things easy, tagging, uh, <laughs> deviant. <laughs> yeah. I did. This was really good. So anyway, uh, that was good fun. Let me just. Uh, okay, you've got ten seconds. There you go. It's closed. Okay. So. Anyway, thank you. Uh, so yeah, all done. Uh, <laughs> so infrastructure as code. 
Uh, if we think back to these days, uh, these kinds of service, big clunky things that we had to manage. Uh, you know, cleaning up this sort of stuff and wondering where the hell do these, do these go? How do they work? What do you do? How do you sort this out? How do you debug a problem? How do you recreate that in another office? Which was a big task. Um, and then along came the cloud. And then along came scripting in infrastructure. Um, we, you know, we had the networks, the data storage, um, databases, kind of secure connections, and so on. And then I could put my feet up a little bit, so, uh, as you'll see. So some of the benefits of infrastructure as code, if they haven't already been mentioned, uh, cheese. Uh, <laughs> so they makes things repeatable, reusable, and scalable. Um, so if you have a, a template, again, as long as it, it is built well, it's written well, uh, you can reuse it. You can use it in different accounts, different environments, um, often different cloud providers. Um, makes it reusable. So, you know, if you're creating lots of resources, they're all very similar, lots of S3 buckets. You should reuse the same template. Why rewrite the template every time? The other thing that makes it scalable, it's a lot easier to kind of quickly create a new EC2 instance or a new uh, Redshift cluster um, to just go deploy, here it is, instead of going click, 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 type, 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 click, type, uh, scratch your head, Type click, you know, it's a lot more scalable in that kind of sense. Gives you a chance to quickly spin up infrastructure, spin it back down again if you don't want it. So, standardization is another thing, um, especially across environments, um, across accounts. Being able to standardize and say, right, this is how we're going to do it. Um, and then it makes it more predictable. So obviously, you can be able to look at, you should be able to look at the template and say, right, that's how it should work. That's the encryption that we're using. You know, this is the size of the disk that we're deploying, um, and things like that. So some of the benefits, you can version control it. So you can put it in Git, Bitbucket, whatever. Um, and you can look at it, you can get it reviewed. Um, you can share it, you can, Share it with the world later. You can make it open source if you want. Um, you can look at the changes. You can see what change broke something a while ago. Um, you can see, you know, Git blame. <laughs> Who set this thing up? You know, all the fun of software engineering. Uh, safe for change management, obviously partially because of the version control. Um, most cloud providers with a kind of infrastructure as code offerings have some kind of change sets that you can use. Often you don't particularly need it, but they don't often let you do anything particularly destructive, um, although that is possible. Um, but being able to check and see the difference, see what's going to change, um, be able to get it reviewed and approved and so on. Being able to allow different permissions. And I used to work in a place where Almost anyone could get to the server room and log in and click around and make some changes. And it was havoc, uh, to be honest. And reduce costs. Again, whether it's time, whether it's effort, whether it's the fact that you can spin it up and say, actually, that's not what I wanted, and take it away again. It's a lot easier to do when it's scripted. Obviously, there are also downsides. It's not all rainbows and butterflies. So if we have new skills required for some people, um, some lucky people are born in the cloud and they scripted infrastructure before they created manually. Um, but obviously for others you have to learn stuff. And it's always evolving as well. You've always got to learn kind of the new functionalities of the services. Sometimes there are different ways of doing it. New tools come out that are more powerful that you need to learn to use. And planning often gets skipped um, because it's so easy sometimes to just deploy something. People just do it. Back when you had to decide exactly what server you were going to buy, who you were going to buy it from, 
you had to get it ordered, it would be delivered, you'd set it all up, you'd go through all the configuration, just really planning it. When it's so easy to spin up virtual environments, you, you just do it and you go, okay, that works, I'll do it again for the next environment. And then sometimes you look back and you go, hold on, that's not going to work, why didn't we plan that? Um, just because it's so easy. Um, and errors can be repeated too. So, you know, just because, you know, things seem to work or whatever, you might reuse a template, it might not be as repeatable as you think, you might have something hard coded. Um, you go, well, it works in this way, why does it work in production? Um, so you get errors across, you know, different templates, different stacks as well. Um, so you do need to be careful of that. Do you think, well, you've got one error or you've got four of them? Which is not great. Stack drift. Um, then, unless you really lock down your environment, those that can create, you know, kind of stacks, create infrastructure with code, can often manually change it too. Um, because we trust each other. Um, because there's no point in locking down things so that they can't touch it, that would be counterproductive. But often that means that when changes get made manually, they try things out, uh, you get stack drift where the template doesn't accurately reflect what is actually deployed anymore, which again makes debugging a nightmare and so on. Kind of, there are things you can kind of put in place to reduce that. There are checks you can do to see how what the differences are, but it's not that straightforward. It's still an issue. An accidental destruction. <laughs> as easy as it is to create a stack, it is to remove a stack. You just click delete stack. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I wouldn't have clicked it otherwise. Delete. Uh, next thing you know, something's gone down. There's infrastructure missing. Um, the good thing is, often it's quite easy to recreate. Um, you just upload the template, create a new stack again. Um, but it's not always that straightforward. Um, but again, there's other things you can put in place to avoid catastrophes if you do accidentally delete things. Um, on another note, one of those is good naming conventions. So people know what they're deleting. And it can still get messy. So things like rollbacks and maintenance. Um, you know, you've got this one template that you use to create S3 buckets. You've used it 300 times now. And then the new feature comes out, allows you to add default encryption. You've got to update the stack for all of those stacks, which is a bit of a nightmare. Um, if, for example, you go to deploy a change and it doesn't work for whatever reason, and it rolls back, um, often then you might have to make some manual changes to be able to progress again, to get it back to where it used to be. Um, yeah, so it can still get messy. So we look at some of the tools. Uh, obviously, this isn't all of them. It's not completely extensive. Uh, so things like Puppet and Chef um, and Opsworks, if you use AWS, allow you to you know, use automation and configuration. So it's kind of like a master node sort of architecture using JSON recipes. So, you know, Chef, recipes, so on. Um, fairly useful. Um, pretty good if you have kind of quite a lot of different servers and things. A lot more we do is serverless, so we're not so worried about that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's like Ansible. So Ansible is a similar sort of thing. It's agentless IT automation. So you just use an SSH to connect to the things that it manages, uh, which obviously means you need to be able to connect all the time. Um, and you use Ansible playbooks. So you can imagine if you have a bit of a run book and you say, right, do these steps. It's a bit like writing a script to you know, use command line commands to recreate the infrastructure. But it's a bit more <laughs> versatile in that you can actually manage and kind of, kind of remove and so on. Terraform, Terraform's a big one. Uh, generally cloud agnostic software for kind of building, managing the infrastructure. Uh, uses a nice little Terraform syntax. Uh, Terraform. Uh, it's, yeah, it's called TFL or something. Oh, like yeah, that. that's it, TFL. Oh, it's called um, 
Yeah, uh, just .tf files. Um, and then there's some other kind of more close specific things like uh, ARM, which is Azure's kind of platform, kind of infrastructure is called Flow Information for AWS, uh, CDK, which is a fairly new one that AWS provides. So you've got kind of specific template formats, usually something like JSON or YAML or one or the other. And then the cloud development kit allows you to script infrastructure, the familiar language like Java, Python, TypeScript, or even C Sharp. Um, and that's progressing a lot. I think when it started, it was just TypeScript, and then along came Java, and then Python, and all the rest. Um, so definitely keep an eye on that, because that's very useful. Um, so, but tools alone will transform your organization. You need to change the mindset of the team because the kind of people that want to just change things manually will just change things manually. And again, we get those issues where some things are scripted, some things are manual, some things are scripted and then changed manually, and you get a stack drift, and it can be a real pain. Um, and again, learning the skills as well, kind of. You know, it, it's not a quick thing to learn, really, to say, right, be a cloud formation expert, be a Terraform expert. It's not like a one or two months, it's more like six to 24 months, um, really, um, to get comfortable with it and to be really happy with it. And even then, it's still frustrating. Um, a lot of people fall into the trap of they try it, they get stuck with something, they get frustrated, and then they change it manually anyway, um, which again, is counterproductive of what we're doing. So, you know, really encourage, as frustrating as it is, uh, don't get lazy. Um, really work it, ask for help. Uh, if you've got a, a template, you want to create something, you know, can it be scripted? You know, is it best to be scripted? Is it easier to manage later? Um, the answer is probably yes. So organizing templates. So general mantra, organize it like it's software. Um, the smaller the better, usually the more modular the better. Separating concerns. Um, so just some examples, obviously there's lots of ways of doing it. Uh, one thing I've seen a few times, which I wouldn't recommend, is each team having a stack each and putting all the resources in that stack. Yeah, that's not a good way to do it. Um, so some examples, you might separate your front-end services. Uh, I realize actually, this isn't saying put all of your front-end services in one stack. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying have templates for individual front-end services. You can have templates for back-end services. You might need to have a template for a shared service, obviously, um, but then keeping things like the base network separate Identity and access management can be kept separate. Um, yeah, and that way, for example, if you get somebody accidentally deletes something, or somebody makes a change and it gets rolled back, it gets stuck in some strange state, uh, you can still manage the important things. It doesn't affect the others as much as it would do otherwise. And although you might think, but then you have more templates, more kind of stacks to manage. It's definitely worth it in the long run. You might also separate the CI/CD pipeline from the main infrastructure. Um, so things like the CI/CD pipeline, if you have some build script and you need to experiment with it, uh, you might end up removing the stack and recreating it for some reason. Uh, whereas your main infrastructure, things like Elasticsearch clusters, uh, you know, data warehouses, you probably don't. You want those to be a bit more. Uh, Isolated, I think is taught really. Um, but these same templates could be used multiple times for different environments, different accounts, different regions, um, and so on. So, general structure um, obviously, this does vary. Not every template will have these. Um, and these are generally the kind of uh, parts of a template most infrastructure is code templates. So that's thinking about Terraform, thinking about CloudFormation, thinking about ARM, 
um, those kinds of things. So you generally have some parameters, um, some input fields, well, the different types, whether it's strings, numbers, uh, whether you can select different lists, different conditions. So you can set a condition, you can say, well, if this parameter is true, then do this. Uh, you know, if this field is empty, then do this, and so on. We'll see some examples of that later. References, obviously being able to reference a parameter, be able to reference other resources. Um, so rather than kind of manually saying this instance, this load balancer, you create the instance, create the load balancer, and the security group, you just reference this instance in the load balancer. And then whatever you know, kind of stack, you use that temp you use that template to create another one, and everything's already there for you. So in one place, it's all linked, but it's dynamic. Mappings. So sometimes you need to map different values to different kind of environments, different stages. We see some more examples of that as well. Uh, conditions. <laughs> if conditions is there twice, that's an accident. Um, I just love the word map. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just love conditions. Um, resources, obviously. Uh, what would the template be any use for without any resources in there? Um, so again, load balances, network topologies, databases, whatever. Dependencies, obviously those resources might be dependent on each other. So for example, if you have a hard disk, an EBS volume, and an EC2 instance, and you want them to be working together, then obviously the EC2 needs to be there. Well, the, the disk needs to be there, the EBS volume needs to be there. The EC2 to be able to create it, be created linked with the EBS volume. Um, or if you need to use an S3 bucket to store your coding for the pipeline, then you need to create the bucket and then create the pipeline. And so on. Um, and sometimes you can force the dependency, so you can say this depends on this. So you wait until this is created successfully first, and then you create that. Some of them are just implicit, some of them are automatic because the cloud provider knows that it needs to be done in that order. Outputs, so useful for just be able to look at the outputs, whether it's like the uh, the host name of a server or whether it's you know kind of just a value, the name of an S3 bucket, especially when you let the template create the name for you, for example, with like a random string or whatever, to make it unique. It's good to have an output so that you can look at the outputs just to get that value quickly. Um, you might also use those outputs to export values, and then you can import them into other stacks. So rather than kind of hard coding things, you can export and import. Um, and then different functions. So whether that's internal functions of whatever cloud provider you're using, or custom functions. So almost all of them provide some kind of functionality for you to create your custom function inside the stack. Although they do get messy. So I'll start with secrets, because this comes up quite a lot. Um, so there's a few different options. Uh, hard coding one is not an option, please. Please don't do that. Input parameters, uh, so you can use uh, no echo. Um, each provider generally has its own alternative of this. So basically, when you, you input it, once you've input it once, uh, it doesn't get displayed as plain text anyway. So you know the password, you put the password in. Internally, the, the template can use it, but it doesn't get passed around every day. It's not kind of visible. Parameter store and sequence manager. So again, every cloud provider has some alternative, whether it's a hash or vault or whatever, being able to get secrets from somewhere or variables from somewhere as well. So some examples, so the input parameters, you can just say type is a string, no echo is true. And as you can see there in the outputs, I and mean, in the resources, parameters, whenever I look back at it, it comes out as just some stars. Parameter store, um, nice and easy. Um, resolve SSM dash secure. 
Master DB pass that stage. Um, so it doesn't have to be a secure string, but if you use a secure string, you can do. So in Secrets Manager Parameter Store, there's a secure string called Master DB pass dash dev, dev test latest beta whatever, and then it'll substitute the stage in there. So it'll basically just resolve whatever value is in there, as long as whatever role you're using to create the stack has permission to get that secret. So don't get that IAM permission. So again, you can lock things down, you can set things up so that certain people can't access uh, secrets. Again, that's the scripting infrastructure, the cloud stuff, makes it a lot easier to manage permissions. Secrets Manager, so again, similar sort of thing. Uh, resolve, Secrets Manager, name of the secret, the secret string, and then you know the, the name that you've given it. So Secrets Manager is a bit different, obviously AWS specific, has uh, name of secret, then in there you might have different key value pairs in that secret. So that key would be GitHub token, and we would get the value of that and resolve it as the OAuth token property in this template. So mappings, so basically just keys and values. You can use internal functions like the finding map to find those values based on other variables. So for example, on the left here, we've got, we've actually got a few different maps here. We've got a database map where you've got MySQL, you have different AMIs, different machine images, ports, default users, databases, Postgres, MSQL. So then later when I try to use, I say, right, my uh, database is MySQL. I'm going to look at the database map, look for MySQL, I'm going to get the port number from there. And you can see it all different. Um, so rather than creating separate resources, one for each one, um, you can put it in the same template. Ideally, the AMIs wouldn't be hard coded quite like this. Mm. <coughs> These are actually golden AMIs, so they've been pre made. Um, and they're not going to change. If they change, we'll obviously update the code anyway. But, uh, you could also put the, the AMI ID in Parameter Store. And you can say when someone updates the AMI, they just update Parameter Store. And then there's nothing hard coded in there. Um, so I've actually used an old version of this template, so these AMIs don't exist anymore, so I'm not bothered. And then, for example, you might have another one, uh, another map, so you can have multiple maps in one template, a uh, disk size map. So if they pick small disk, they get 30 gig, medium, 50, large, 100. And obviously that could change. And then to use it, it's fairly simple. If we look at the volume size property, We'll find in disk, uh, find in map, disk size map. And the reference is a reference to the parameter that the user has put in. So the, the user has selected small, medium, or large for the disk size. And then it uses that as the size. So it finds you know, small, medium, or large, finds the size property in the disk size map. So if I say medium, I would get 50 gig. So it basically just resolves that to 50. So instead of typing 50, you get that. Image ID, similar thing. Again, you can see if you use a different map, database map, I was referencing the database type. Um, yeah, and now again, where you use a reference, you may use, you know, you know, it might be a string of some kind, it might be reference to a resource of some kind, uh, you might be getting properties of another resource you've created. So, yeah. It can be pretty flexible. Export and importing. So, like I said earlier, you can output values and then import them. So rather than hard coding mappings or inputting them manually, so you know you might have to type them in as parameter or uh, you know hard code them in mappings that might change in the future. The problem with that is it's not completely kind of repeatable. Um, it's not that easy to automate it without some kind of human interaction, unless you're always a single values, which goes against the point of having variables. Um, but you can export and import values. So you can, you know, 
We'll see an example of that in a second, but I will warn you that it can leave some undesired complications when you're new to it. Um, so, for example, if you export a value and then you import it in another stack, you can't delete the first stack or you can't remove the output from that first stack because the other stack is relying on it. So you get that dependency. So you'd have to work backwards, you'd have to remove the import and then you can remove the export from the first stack. Now, once you know that, it makes complete sense. But trying to read that and the outputs and the error logs and things can be a bit of a nightmare. But once you've had some practice, you can use it fairly well. I think parameter store is probably still a better alternative, but obviously this fits in quite well with um, cloud formation and so on. So, for example, I outputted uh, a certificate ALM um, and I so I've exported that. I've sent I've joined up so again this is another internal function of cloud formation. I've joined PKI dash stage dash certificate and that's the name of the, the export and then the value is referencing PKI uh, which isn't a great name to be honest basically a certificate in May that is created and the resource name is Peak AI. Um, and then underneath A, for the load balancer, uh, where I've set the certificate ARN, it's a property, um, I've actually used an if statement. So I could just reference it straight away. Um, or I could make it a bit more flexible. I could say if default load balancer SSL certificate is true, um, then import PKI dash certificate. Well, that doesn't quite work um, for product does. Um, or, if not, reference load balance certificate. Uh, so that's a condition. So default load balance SSL certificate is a condition. It's either true or false. Um, the reference to LB certificate is a parameter that somebody's put in. So they can either type in the parameter and say, use, don't use the default, or they can just say, use the default. So you can pick. <coughs> which makes it more reusable for other people as well. Onto conditions, so this might make a bit more sense now. Conditionally create resources or assign values to variables using internal functions. For example, um, this is a SageMaker notebook template. Um, sometimes you want to have a shared file system so we've got create EFS is a condition, but well, it's a parameter first of all. So you start with a parameter, you can say true or false. And then you have the condition. So if you just look at the, the one from the bottom, create EFS. So that says, basically you work out, is it true or false? So you use the equals function, reference create EFS, that's the value that the user just put in which we've said can either be true or false. If that is equal to the value after it, so if it's equal to true, then that condition is true. If they selected false, then that condition would not be true, and therefore create the FX would evaluate to false. And then you can use it later. So you can say the FS file system is a resource, and you set a condition. And the condition is create EFS, so it's true or false. If the value is false, then it won't create that resource. So it only creates it if that is true. So it allows the user to say create it or don't create it. You can kind of set it based on other things. If you look back as well, there's a few conditions here where we've used we've used the not function, where we said where KMS key ID is not equal to blank. So that means basically if the KMS key ID has some kind of value, then has, has KMS key is true. Has existing uh, lifecycle configuration config, uh, you know, if custom com lifecycle config is not blank, then we assume that there is one existing. Uh, but if you don't have one, you just leave it blank. And you can obviously in your parameter, you can have a description, you might say, 
optional, you might say leave it blank if you don't have it, just to get more information for the user. Again, making it reusable and maintainable. So, uh, have I covered that? Yes, or, uh, so like I said, the variables, the values. We have lifecycle config name. Um, we check here, is, you know, has lifecycle config true? Um, if it is, then reference the custom lifecycle <coughs> configuration. If not, we go to another statement that says, if createFS is true. Uh, if it is, then join up the notebook name that is the parameter uh, with a hyphen and then lifecycle config. Um, so that is the name that it gives it. If you know create, create EFS was true um, and custom lifecycle config was false. If custom lifecycle config was true, then obviously you wouldn't even look at the EFS stuff. Now if like custom life article config is false and create EFS is false. You can see the last statement there references AWS no value. Basically just leaves it blank, doesn't give it a name. Um, often with properties, um, they'll have obviously a regular expression that says it can't be null. So obviously not giving it a value would be null, but giving it blank value is not no. Yeah. You get the concept. An AWS no value is a pseudo parameter that allows you to put no value without calling it null. Testing. Okay, so we know how to test other languages. How do we do that with infrastructure? And sometimes we just have to try it for real. Um, advice for that is use a sandbox of some kind. So you know, we have that test account that we can use. Um, and then also it's a good check of repeatability. Because if you can deploy it in the test account, and then a dev account, and then a product account, yeah, you know it's repeatable, really, without having to do kind of too many manual stuff. Um, there are some options for things like template validation. Uh, so there's a package called CFN Linked. Uh, it's available for most popular uh, text editors, so I add to VS Code, I think Sublime has a plugin as well. Um, definitely worth having a look. Once you get your head around it, it's quite useful. Uh, whether it's like syntax, whether it's indentation, which can be a big thing with like YAML. Uh, missing curly braces and JSON configs as well. Um, now you can also put things like CFN lint into pipelines, build pipelines. If you have a pipeline that's building your infrastructure, you could put it in there as well. You could check it and you say, okay, well, that's failed. Um, you know, fail the build. You could upload it to the um, developer, you know, the design, the yeah. cloud formation design and things as well. Yeah. yeah, so just in case anyone missed it from Chris, uh, for AWS and probably other cloud providers, there's a, a visual designer which allows you to basically build your template and visualize it, which if you've got a chance at the end, we'll have a quick look at that. Um, and that will allow you to validate it um, and just see how things are mapped out. It's quite useful. It's quite a good way of quickly drawing uh, architecture diagram as well. Um, so, uh, obviously one of the things there is iterate. So things can get messy. Uh, especially when you deploy the new stack from scratch for the first time. Uh, cloud formation itself is a pain when the first create fails. Because often, if you can't create the first time, it won't allow you to roll back. It'll roll back because you'll have no resources. But you've got to delete the stack before you can update it again. Which is a pain, obviously. Right? Um, so start simple. Um, and then add more resources as you go along. So for example, just add something like an S3 bucket. You have to have a resource of some kind. <coughs> Create a really simple S3 bucket, and then you have the stack, and then you can update the stack. Because the second time you update, well, after the first update, if it rolls back, you can keep updating. Whereas if the first one fails, you end up in this form of purgatory. Um, we just have to delete the stack and then recreate it. 
Uh, and also deletion policy attribute. Um, so we don't use many of these actually. Um, but like I said earlier, sometimes things do get accidentally deleted. And it can be a real pain if, for example, uh, somebody deletes a stack, or even if you delete the stack on purpose, and then suddenly you've lost your Redshift cluster, which had loads of data in. Hopefully you've got snapshots of backups, but it's not quick. Um, things like S3 buckets. Now S3 buckets are a bit different because they have to be empty to delete it anyway. Um, so you get that extra bit there. But um, if, for example, you have a stack um, and you change lots of your architecture, but you still want to keep that resource, like you want to keep that S3 bucket, um, but you want to delete the rest of the stack, you can use the, the delete policy attribute. So you can say delete policy is retained. So you keep it. Um, different resources have different uh, options for the property. For example, RDS has a snapshot property. So you can take a snapshot in the database and then get rid of the database. Um, so that's the kind of thing if you had a Postgres database, you know, you might want to put that on there. So that if anything is actually deleted or whatever. Uh, but of course you could end up with resources that end up being there forever because nobody deleted them. Obviously think about that as well. Again, you might set a parameter with a condition. It says, do you want to keep it? Do you want to retain it? Uh, 